Welcome to Muslim Apologetics Australia. In this video, I'm going to be refuting Mufti Abu Leif on his response to Hagia Sophia being converted to a masjid. So he uses a verse in the Quran and what we're going to do is we're going to address his claim and continue to pause the video and respond to where we believe he's committing an error. So let's see what he says. Thoughts on all of this. That's the backdrop to it. I would say, uh, and adding to that, in the time of the Salaf, when we look at the Sahaba's time, many of them did not, uh, like when you look at the rulers like uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab, when he conquered Jerusalem, uh, he didn't convert the holy sites into masjids. And even though he was given an opportunity and there was, there was no resistance to Sayyidina Umar's entrance to Jerusalem, he did not convert the, you know, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre or other, uh, or other kind of holy sites to, Christ, to Muslim holy sites. He didn't do that. And that was never the objective of Islam. Okay, so again, uh, all of these people are using Umar ibn Khattab as an example. Now, just because Umar ibn Khattab didn't do it, doesn't mean it's not valid, <laughs> right? Now, you got to go back to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Did the Prophet Muhammad ever object? Did he say you can't convert a Christian church into a Muslim mosque? Did he do that? And when we go to Hadith in Nasai, that Sahaba did in fact go out and um, demolish a church, their existing church, and they res erected and rebuilt a masjid. This is in Hadith. So using Umar ibn Hattab as an example is not an example of Islam. Yes, he is an example of Islam. He, you know, he, we can look at his behavior, his teachings, but you need to show us where did Umar ibn Hattab say it's forbidden? Did Umar ibn Hattab himself actually say it's forbidden? The second point is Umar ibn Hattab made a treaty with uh, the people of, um, uh, well, at that time when he went back into Jerusalem. So the peace treaty was that their churches will be protected because they weren't hostile and they accepted the treaty because they didn't fight the conqueror. They basically gave up and they accepted his authority. And so he didn't take Jerusalem by force. <laughs> Whereas it's a different context when it comes to Cons Constantinople where the Christians did not um, allow, well, they didn't basically accept to be conquered. They didn't accept the Muslim rulership. They didn't accept the peace treaties. And so there's a total different context when we're looking at what Umar ibn Hattab did and, and the, the conquest compared to Constantinople. So here is the hadith from Talak Ibn Ali, may Allah be pleased with him. We went out as a delegation to the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. We gave him bayah, oath to him and prayed with him. We told him that in our land we had a place of worship. The word used indicates a Jewish or Christian place of worship. And we asked him to give us some water left over from his wudu. So he called for the water and did wudu and rinsed his mouth. Then he poured the water into a vessel and told us, go and when you reach your land, knock down that place of worship and sprinkle this water over the place. Then use the place as a mosque. We said our land is far away and the heat is intense. The water will dry up. He said, add more water to it. It will only increase it in its goodness. So we set out and then when we reached our land, we knocked down our place of worship, sprinkled water on the place and used it as a mosque. We called the Adan there, and when the monk and the man from Tayyi heard it, he said the call of truth. Then he climbed one of our hills, and he, we never saw him again. Reported by Al-Nasai 694.
That's the hadith. So the above narration is a clear example that in the Prophet's time, the Prophet Muhammad himself ordered that a church can be converted to a mosque. Now, I know what Abu Leif likes to do is he likes to say, oh, um, you know, some hadith he reckons are questionable or, or it's weak, but this is an authentic hadith. Uh, and also, um, if he's going to say hadiths are false, because I know he's, he's actually, you know, he makes that sort of judgment even on Sahih Bukhari, <laughs> right? So the hadith that he quotes referencing Umar going into um, uh, Jerusalem, they're actually from Sahih Bukhari and Muslim as well. So he needs to be consistent. If he makes a video response to say, well, that hadith is questionable, why doesn't he doubt the ones about Umar? So he needs to be consistent. And we know that Umar radiallahu anh, he made a covenant. It says, the covenant made by the Prophet with the Christians of Najra, which placed them under the protection of Allah and his Prophet and provided for them safeguard of their wealth, religion and churches. The one made by Umar ibn Hattab with the citizens of Ilya, Jerusalem. Uh, so it says in Tariq Tabari, volume 3, 609, this is a protection which the servant of Allah, Umar ibn Hattab, commander of the faithful, extends, the safeguarding the lives of property, churches and crosses. So he's specifically talking about Jerusalem because, again, it's under a covenant. So when something is under a covenant or a treaty and you say that you're going to come in there and you're going to protect the churches, this is part of the peace treaty because your enemy combatants, they've accepted peace. They don't want war. They accept your rulership under that circumstance. So then you can't then apply that logic and that system in that context onto Hagia Sophia, which was a total different context. Yes, it was conquered, but... I mean, both instances were conquered, but Umar ibn Hattab did not lift a sword when he, when he went into Jerusalem. However, the enemies in Constantinople, they were warring against the Muslims. So the context is different now. So again, there is no peace treaty. There is no covenant. And so that's why Hagia Sophia was converted and the Muslims took over those buildings. Uh, later on, yes, there were peace treaties made and they allowed freedom of religion and allowed certain other churches. But the context for this cannot be applied. The context of Jerusalem cannot be applied for Constantinople. And we already saw that the Prophet Muhammad already in Nasi, in that hadith, he already accepted to give uh, um, some sahaba. He gave them water and so forth and he helped them and he told them to go and turn that particular church to a masjid. Okay, so let's go in now to uh, refute the other claim that they always bring up is a verse in the Quran that apparently gives the protection of churches. So let's listen. Uh, Allah speaks. Uh, so the one just preceding that, leading into that, mentions, If Allah had not set up a certain people to resist against another group of people, so to repeat that Lola Daf Allah in Nasa Ba'dahum Bibab. If Allah had not set up a a group of people to resist an opposing group, La Huddimat Sawami'a. Monasteries, uh, places of worship, on people say synagogues, or salawatun, and areas for restricted or restricted areas for prayer, or masajid, that these things would have all been destroyed. In, in all of these places, Allah's name is glorified often. Now notice Allah says about Sawami'a, about Christian monasteries, Allah's name is glorified in them. So 
and synagogues. Allah does not say, and this is, you know, Surah Al-Hajj, this is speaking, this is in Medina. Allah is speaking about how uh, Muslims should be because he goes on to say, الَّذِينَ إِمَّا fil الْأَرْضِ Who are these people? These are those people who, if we give them dominion, this is what they do. That they would prevent such things, tragedies from happening. So Islam does not... Okay, so that is, again, is butchered the context and understanding. Uh, first of all, when Allah says, um, if he doesn't check one nation by another, then all of the monasteries will be destroyed, then what about all of the monastery, uh, the mosques that have been destroyed in the Balkans? So are you now accusing Allah of... of uh, uh, of saying falsified statements in the Quran because he obviously hasn't checked one nation by another there because a lot of the mosques uh, in the Balkans have been destroyed. Uh, even in the in in the Serbian wars, how many mosques have been have been destroyed? Uh, so again, that verse doesn't talk about protection, complete protection. That's that Allah speaking in general terms that uh, in certain places of history, Allah has minimized the destruction of places of worship because he has allowed um, one nation to check another nation. And the other point is Hagia Sophia was never destroyed. Hagia Sophia was never destroyed. So the building still is there. It's not destroyed. So then that verse doesn't apply. The, 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 the monastery is still protected. Thirdly, the Christians did, don't mention Allah's name in the monastery. So then Hajj Sophia is, is exempted. So that is obviously talking about the early Unitarians. And we know that the Byzantine Empire and those Christians, they weren't Unitarians. They were always Trinitarians. Uh, so... And they don't mention Allah's name. So again, that verse doesn't obviously apply there. And secondly, when you use that verse of the Quran to say Allah checks one nation by another, and by doing so, it protects the um, it protects Hagia Sophia. Well, was Hagia Sophia protected when uh, the Muslims conquered it? That wasn't protected, it was taken over. So you need to be careful when you're using the Quran to make an argument because that's not what the Quran is saying. The Quran is not saying that every message is, is to be protected. It's, it was only speaking in, in general terms that every church to be protected and every temple to be protected throughout history. So... You need to be careful when you're misquoting the Quran because it, it's, it's working against you at the moment. So Islam does not set out to convert holy sites to mosques. It's never, that's never been the goal of Islam. But people, Muslims have done that. Okay, many, not just Muslims, many people have done that. One may argue that... I agree it's not the goal because the goal is to do everything through peace treaties and, and so forth. But you got to understand that there are certain circumstances where that doesn't always happen. And we've already provided the hadith that shows already that the Prophet converted a church into a mosque uh, through the Sahabi. One of the reasons they did that is because that these were the main buildings in their time. So people built, you know, their places of worship as major buildings. So whenever a new community came, they saw that major building and they thought, yeah, that's, you know, that's a perfect choice to make it into a prayer facility since it's designed like that. And you see that Muslims did that, Christians did that in Muslim Spain, they did that as well, uh, you know, they turned many of the masjids. But to be fair, Muslims, when they took over, they turned the, the Christian things into masjids. They also, when they took over, turned the Muslim things into Christian cathedrals. It seemed to be, you know, back and forth, a kind of a law of the jungle that took place in the medieval times. 
It was a law of the jungle that took place in the medieval times. It was neither, it was not encouraged by Islam, but it wasn't prohibited if it was just something that seems to have been the politics of men that they did. So, okay, well, at least he's a bit fair now. I was, I, I was pretty negative towards Mufti Abu Leif. I mean, I'm running through the video for the first time now. So, well, I'm actually glad that he's admitted that it isn't um, forbidden to actually convert it. So, well, so I'm, I'm pretty surprised about that. So I'm actually giving, I've never done this before. I'm giving Mufti Abu Leif a thumbs up on this one. That they did. So, okay, just to be clear on that. So if they did it in the past, I'm not saying it was haram. It wasn't, uh, I suppose they've kind of conquered and this is what they did. I don't think it was a good thing. I don't think it's a good thing, but it, I wouldn't say it was haram per se because it was their politics, it was their kind of battles, it was what they were doing. And, you know, everybody seemed to be like a, a practice that people were doing, like the way they took slaves. I think that's a it was a detestable thing but the whole world was doing it muslims were doing it christians were doing it, everybody was doing it so it's like that now uh, in that aspect i disagree with him because again that would then be accusing the prophet muhammad of doing something bad too uh, <laughs> uh, it's hard to get consistency out of abu Leith because he's, he's made a lot of controversial remarks but again saying it was a mistake or politics. I mean, we've seen the prophet himself do it. So, again, and, you know, I always make this argument, and I think it's a valid argument. Uh, no one says it's a bad thing to remove Islam from politics. No one says it. So I'm talking about most of the liberal modernists, like Mufti Abu Leith, right, the progressive ones. They never dismiss saying, um, you know, it's, it's wrong to, to remove religion from politics, from, from political delegation, meaning that the governments run their laws through God's legislation. They say it has no place in modern politics. It shouldn't be uh, based on religious texts and secular liberal values and laws should be separate. And so, again... Isn't that a bad thing? So we had these secular liberalists come in and change Islamic governments. You know, they used to be they used to run on Khilafah, yeah? So they came in, they put their imperialism and they got rid of their Khilafah. They they basically put their noses in where they shouldn't have and they removed it. And they don't want it to come back. They don't want it to come back in even modern politics. And so if they're doing it, if they're removing Islam or Sharia law from Islamic countries and petitioning to change it, why isn't that a bad thing? You know, you're bringing secular liberalism into it. But then if a Muslim uh, brings... Uh, Sharia or Islam back into that church and converts it into an Islamic prayer room, that somehow starts to become objectionable. That's, that's wrong now. But we allow secular progressive liberalists come into Sharia constitutions, changing it into, um, into secular progressive liberalism, as they call it. So... There's a huge double standard here. It's like, you're a Muslim. You can't change my church into a Muslim mosque. But I'm a secular liberalist. I'm going to change your Islamic constitution into a secular liberal one. Double standards. It's not about halal haram. Okay, because the Hagia Sophia is in a Muslim country. It is the property of the state of Turkey. It is the property of Turkey. They can, you know, from an Islamic perspective and from this statutory legal perspective, they can do with it whatever they want. You know, they, it's a listed building, but if Turkey decides to 
turn it into whatever it wants. They could, you know, they could say, we're going to put a car park on this side. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to, you know, it's up to them. Okay. So, but the question is, is this a rightful action, right and wrong? And there are things like the Hadith teaches you that you will know them when they are wrong. I would say that this Hagia Sophia, Aya Sophia, converting it into a masjid is absolutely wrong. Well, if you're saying that now, <laughs> Mufti Abu Leif, then you're actually disapproving of your own prophet because your own prophet converted a, masjid, a, a church into a masjid. So again, you're going to have to reject your own prophet for doing that if you're saying it's absolutely wrong. Got here. The blue masjid, yeah, the Sultan Ahmed Masjid, by walking on foot is a four-minute walk from the Hagia Sophia. A four-minute walk. <laughs> four minutes. That's how it is. Literally just in front of it. Right. Now, there is no need for a new masjid. We don't have a need. First of all, I'm just trying to eliminate that aspect. There is no need, okay? The Sultan Ahmed Mas Masjid, the blue mosque, famous blue mosque, has the capacity of at least 10,000 people inside it. It's a huge masjid. Um, so first of all, just to clarify, it's not a need basis. I just want to get that out the way. The second thing is... Uh, I want to refute that. When you say that there's a... Another masjid four minutes away that holds 10,000 people, we don't need it. You can't make that judgment upon now. I mean, you don't know what the population will be. I mean, the population in Turkey, what, it's 80 plus million. So for you to say we don't need another masjid just because another masjid four minutes away holds 10,000 people, that is not an argument. Because we don't know what the population of Turkey will be in the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, 100 years from now on. Turkey's population in 100 years could double. Could. From 80 million, who knows, it could get to 160 million. So for you to say we don't need it is not an argument based on figures is that people might say okay there isn't a need but this used to be a mosque so we have the haq as turks in the country turkey it is a muslim it is a country of muslims by population democratically speaking we can convert it back can we not but then i will say to you and this i'm saying to all muslims who are supporting this yeah you know, and they're acting all emotional. Oh my God, the Hagia Sophia had the Adhan. Are... <laughs> stupid. I'm not going to let you get the... Yeah, <laughs> that is so stupid. Because every masjid in, in Istanbul has got the Adhan. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh my God, we've heard the Adhan from the Hagia Sophia. Oh my God, I'm so emotional. Abeo mere chache. <laughs> you know that large blue masjid over there? What is that <laughs> announcing? What are all these other hundreds of masjids in Istanbul announcing every day, five times a day? The Adhan. Stop acting like you've never heard the Adhan. Stop being such a drug. Look, I want to say to all these people who are having this cathartic moment of joy and they're saying, well, we have the legal right because democratically... There are more Muslims. I mean, there's atheists and Christians there as well. But there are more Muslims in Turkey, clearly. And therefore, it's under our jurisdiction. We can turn it into a mosque. Okay, so let's pause it there. Here's Alva Billah. May Allah um, guide this person. Uh, he's literally mocking the Azan, literally mocking the Azan. And this is why I say he needs to go get checked, maybe get a reading done on him. Because uh, he makes some outrageous statements. And I honestly say from the bottom of my heart, the man needs to get a reading done on him. Um, no one mocks the Ezan in that way. Regardless how many Adhans there are, 
it doesn't mean just because we've got so many ezans that we don't want the ezan to come from this particular masjid, which is Hajj Sofia, because that represents a Muslim history. Um, and so the other point is, just because the other messages are four or five minutes away, it doesn't mean you could all hear the Edan standing from Hajj Sofia. And Hajj Sofia also caters a lot of tourists who actually come there. And so when the Ezan does come from there, it will give them a spiritual reminder as well and tie them to the masjid. And who knows, maybe they could convert to Islam through hearing it from that. Every, every masjid has a spiritual connection. And so when they hear the Edan from Hajj Sofia, it will probably give them a spiritual connection to Islamic history and, and tie them closer to the mosque. Uh, so I think his mockery of this um, was was not called for, and he obviously doesn't understand the benefits from this. Um, the other point is the uh, Hagia Sophia was turned into a museum, and so it was actually a secular symbol to show that they destroyed God in Turkey. They said, we buried your God in a museum. And this is why it's even more so important that the Ezan again is proclaimed from that particular masjid to symbolize that Allah, that Allah is certainly not buried in this masjid and this masjid is ever living. Yeah? So... Um, one needs to understand the history of what Mustafa Kemal Atatürk did in that country to, sh to shut religion down specifically. So it's even more so important to bring this masjid alive with its, with its adhan. There, that this masjid used to belong to such and such temple of such and such lord before it became a masjid. It is our right as a democratic majority of India as Hindus to convert those masjids back to Hindu temples. Why not? All we need is, uh, you know, it's the law. It's the law of Thrasymachus. Might is right. It's whoever has the majority. All we need is a legal right and we can do it. So why are you crying your heads off at things like Jerusalem? You know, what's your problem? Or is it, oh, acha acha, when it's against us, then it's bad. You know, this is the stupidity, the lack of insight. Okay, so I've already addressed this. So his claim is that uh, we shouldn't do unto others what we don't want done unto ourselves. Um, again, that's, I understand his argument, but from a perspective of, I mean, in Islam, we believe that we need we need to conquer, uh, and if we do get conquered, then that's just bad luck. So I'm not I'm, I don't sit there and say, oh, well, you know, why is um, why is the Jews turning L? Why are they taking Palestine, for example? I don't, I don't sit there and cry and say that's not their right. Of course it's their right. If they want to conquer it, they can conquer it. Because that's what they want to do. They want to conquer and take. Whoever's in power takes. That's it. So I'm not one of those Muslims. But if they're going to conquer because they have power, we're going to conquer too. When we get power, we're going to conquer too. That's that's part of life. That's how it all works. Um, and... Our belief needs to be consistent too because they have also conquered Islamic countries and Islamic values. They do it all the time. They want to take Muslim countries into progressive Western morals. So accept LGBTQI, accept alcohol, accept pork, accept, you know, accept um, Darwinian evolution. Except all of their theories, except homosexuality, except same-sex marriages, 
you know. So that's conquering, isn't it? Isn't that part of conquering? So if you're, you're saying don't do unto others what you don't like doing on yourselves, but you are always imposing stuff on the Muslims. Don't use our belief. Trying to change Islam, trying to remove Sharia, trying to make it more secular and progressive. So Abu Leif is accusing Muslims for tr for getting upset at um, temp. Uh, you know, if the Hindus are turning Muslim mosques into temples, but at the same time, he will he's saying we shouldn't be. You know, what why do you Muslims get upset about this? But he's also doing things. He's also trying to change Islam, Muslims. He's trying to change Islamic countries into progression, he, into Western type of progression. He's trying to end the Khilafah. He doesn't want the Khilafah to come back. So, again, this is part of civilization. You want to impose your values on a particular society and the Muslims want to impose their values on a particular society. So you're not exempted from this uh, Mufti Abu Leith. You're in the same ideology of trying to change things. And you're not a person that sits back and says that Muslim country should, you know, can run under Sharia and that secular country can run under secularism. No, you say that all Muslim countries are going backwards into ancient time if they stick to Sharia law and run their country on Sharia. So you want to change those Muslim countries as well. <laughs> But then if we Muslims want to try and change countries that are secular into Islam, then you get upset. Abu Leif gets upset too, doesn't he? Right? Abu Leif will get upset. If I got up and said, I want to change United Kingdom into a Sharia country, he's going to get upset. But Abu Leif also comes into Muslim countries and says, they need to progress. They need to become secular. They shouldn't run on Sharia law. So, Abu Leif... You know, you're pointing a finger, but you got three fingers pointing back. Was, first of all, Temple of Solomon, before it was any masjid. So, yeah, so I, I feel that this is, you know, part of this is the right-wing fascism that is rising in the world today. And it's not just Hindu nationals. It's not just Trump supporters. It's not just uh, far-right Jewish Zionists. It's also Muslims as well who are doing exactly the same thing, except they're coming back crying wolf when, you know, when it's being done against Muslims. And so, yeah, I am crying wolf, Abu Leith. You're, you're bringing secular imperialism into the Muslim world and you're changing the Muslim world and bringing uh, and removing anything that's got to do with religious conservatism and you're wanting it to be secular. You're forcing that ideology on the Muslim world. So why are we being hypocritical here? Okay, so that's it basically. And um, so, and Abu Leith obviously wants to do a bit of, uh, you know, sympathizing with the Kufar at the end of his video saying, oh, we need to be tolerant in order for them to be tolerant towards us. <laughs> really? Really? So we need to be tolerant to them so they can be tolerant to us. Really? Really? And, and has that worked? Has that really worked in history? Have you not heard when Allah SWT says in the Quran, how many verses, that the Jews and the Christians will never be pleased with you until you accept their religion? You didn't accept this one? You don't accept this verse? Hmm? And you're still trying to uh, suck up to them. You're still trying to please them in order to give up your religion, in order to give up your history, in order to give up you know, your identity. No, we don't please them. Our objective is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. I, so, I, so I am kind of like... I, I see all these things and I see the ignorance and it really, and I see the insecurities and it does disturb me. That's why I was saying that. And I've seen these videos on the Mandir as well, by the way, in, in Islamabad. I've, I actually see the insecurities of you because um, it shows that you are ashamed of your religion in making it 
transcend all other religions. I think you have the insecurities, actually, Abu Layth. And people have gone there and they're saying that anyhow this mandir is built and if Imran Khan wants to build a mandir, he should build it in his backyard. <laughs> they're like, where he's got a mansion behind that, he should just build a Hindu temple then. Yar, what is the problem? What is the problem? Honestly, I don't get it. You know, this whole thing of, see, Muslim, this is the problem. We've become such bigots. We want everybody to be tolerant towards us. We want everybody to give us a second chance. We want everybody not to judge us, to be accommodating for us. When Pakistan Muslims will talk of India, they will say, Yar, what's wrong with these people? Why can't they accommodate for those Muslims? Why can't, why... Can't they allow them to build their masjid? Why can't they allow them to carry on with the madrasa? Why can't they allow them to have their own talaq system? Why can't they allow them to... All of these things they will say. Muslim, Pakistani will say, yeah, what's wrong with India? Why doesn't... And when it comes to them, oh my God, allow Hindus to have a temple. Toba, Toba, Toba. This is the land of Tawheed. Um, <laughs> Again, this is Abu Layth's own ignorance. The only reason why Muslims actually demand to have masjids in the West is because Western theology claims that they believe in religious freedoms for all. They believe equality for all, no matter what you are. And so... Upon that standard, that's why Muslims actually demand their rights. So, for example, polygamy is not allowed in the West, but they allow LGBTI. And so that's, that's why, um, well, same-sex marriages, they allow for LGBTI. And so the Muslims are now demanding, There are, I, I know Muslims who demand and say we want those sorts of rights too, under the same Human Rights Commission. So that's not hypocritical because they're following a standard that caters for that. But Muslim countries don't cater for the same moral values as the West. And so it's not hypocritical for them to say, let us do it over there in the West, but if you want to try it here, we're not, we're not going to allow it. That's not hypocritical because had Muslims said that we also believe in the same values you believe in in, in, in secular liberalism and, and, and that sort of progression, then, yeah, and, and we still forbid Hindu temples or we still forbid LGBTI in the Muslim countries, then yeah, of course, that would be hypocritical. But Muslims, I mean, conservative Muslims anyway, that believe in Sharia, that believe in, you know, the fundamentals, the more orthodox Muslims. Again, you may be able to apply that logic to liberalist, secular, liberal, progressive ones living in Pakistan or those Muslim countries, but you can't use that same logic upon people of Tawheed and on Sharia who believe in Khilafah and who believe in orthodoxy, who don't believe in secular liberalism. You can't apply that logic to us because we're not the ones uh, that claim that they should, but we're only saying they have to or they have to consider it because they need to be consistent by their own standards, their own laws, and their own laws say they need to do that. And if they don't, then they are proving they're the hypocrites. The West are proving they're, they're the hypocrites because they're claiming religious freedom for all, but they're only um, favouring one religion and not the other. Let me give you an example. In Australia, for example, um, you, you can't do Adhan from Minarets. You can't do the loud Adhan, but they allow Christian bells. And so there's a double standard because they're saying there's equal rights. Uh, they're saying that they've got religious tolerance for all. 
and yet they're favoring Christianity over Islam. And so we're calling them for hypocrisy. Uh, but if they turn around and said in their constitution that we only cater for Christianity and we don't cater for any other religion, then of course it would be hypocritical for me to try and impose my belief and say, well, why don't you put a mosque there too? Yes, that would be hypocritical. But again, it's not hypocritical if they're the ones who are saying we, we, that's our system. We allow that, that sort of religious freedom and religious rights. So that's not hypocritical. It is hypocritical, again, if we don't, um, if we claim that we're progressive and we're liberal and we're secular, um, but then we forbid it here. That would be hypocritical. But I'm not of the Muslims who claim I'm secular liberal and I'm progressive in that sense that we give total freedoms for Hindu temples. Yes, of course, there are. You know, even as a Muslim, I believe that, yes, we should give minorities rights. If they pay the jizya, you can allow churches. Uh, but that also has min uh, regulations such as, um, you know, uh, like, for example, the Pact of Umar, where he gave certain restrictions. The churches can't be higher than mosques or taller or they can't display their crosses or um, uh, they can't start preaching the gospel in the street. Because that would be inviting kufr. Uh, and we need to prevent kufr. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands that. He says, the Prophet sallallahu said in the hadith, that if you see an evil, then you've got to try and stop it. So yes, they can preach in their privacy, but they can't start preaching into the Muslim community. Um, and again, that's not hypocritical because my scripture says that. And so I'm following that scripture. But if you say to me, well, why are you preaching in, an, in a non-Muslim country? Well, I can because their, their worldview believes that I can, even though they're trying to stop it, <laughs> uh, which again, it means that secular democracy is biting them on, the, on their foot because they're seeing the growth of Islam because of the preaching. Uh, and so they're getting upset about it. But again, that's not my problem. That's their problem. That's their secular liberal values that's coming to bite them. And for those who claim, oh, you know, you're, you just admitted that your religion is growing because um, you're censoring Christian missionaries over here. And no, that, I mean, that I'm, I'm, I'm censoring, I'm censoring a system. I'm not censoring that, you know, because I th you think that it's the tr I think it's the truth and I'm scared of the truth and I'm trying to censor it. It's got nothing to do with that. I'm actually scared that you're going to send people to hell that ultimately your falsehood is going to come trick my people for them to go to hell. So I'm going to do everything, just, just as I would prevent, um, prevent against drug dealers trying to deal drugs to my people. I'm going to stop those drug dealers. It's not because I'm scared because, you know, you know, I, I just, you know, because drugs are good or, you know, there's, there's good benefits of, I mean, of marijuana because it gives you, Cumments or, or, you know, gives you a great time, you know, taking party drugs. You know, it, it, it makes you forget yourself and makes you happy. And, you know, you Muslim must be against happiness because you don't allow recreational drugs and people to have fun. No, I'm, that's, that's not the argument. The argument is that's causing harm. And it's, it's spiritually killing these people and it's physically killing these people, and I don't accept that. And that's what I believe. Preachers who are coming to Muslim countries and preaching openly, that's spiritually killing them, uh, and, more, and physically as well, but more spiritually in, in the afterlife. So we've we got to prevent that. And again, that's not hypocritical. That's our standard. If I say, yes, we do give complete religious freedoms, and then I start banning people coming to preach in Muslim countries. Yes, then that would be hypocritical. But I don't claim that. Ignorant people who only know victimhood. We can only cry when we're victims. We're never compassionate towards other people. We're never like understanding. We are just always, oh, the world doesn't show us sympathy. The world doesn't show us sympathy. 
Well, yeah, I mean, this is why I actually I do support them building for other cultures. So where do you show the sympathy when you've completely but you're banning Sharia law, people to run under Sharia law? Where is the sympathy there? Where is the compassion? I mean, what about Muslims who just want to practice Sharia law amongst themselves under a Sharia system, a separate system from secular law, secular liberalism, a, a total different system? I mean, just think about it as like a parallel system, right? That whoever wants to be governed under secular liberalism can go to those courts. Who want, whoever wants to be governed by Sharia courts can go to Sharia courts. Why don't you have that? Yes, United Kingdom has a few, but they're very limited in their proceedings and their rulings. Again, so why don't we all have that in secular countries? So how come, Mufti Abulev, you guys are so intolerant of Sharia law that you don't allow this? Hmm? Again, so why the double standards and why the hypocrisy? Again, I told you, Abulev, if there are, if there's, if you're pointing a finger, there's three fingers pointing back. But yeah, I hope these words, uh, you know, give some meaning to those who wanted me to speak about it. So there you have it.